So in this episode we need to get into painting brew pegs fuel tanks. So uh, for us, because we're doing a veggie oil conversion, so we can run the boat on diesel or veggie oil, we need to paint our fuel tanks. Now normally in a trawler like this you don't paint the fuel tanks, you just leave them as beer mild steel, um, and that's fine, it lasts you know, decades like that. For us, because we're running on veggie oil, but because these tanks will have veggie oil them at, at times, we need to be able to um, have the oil in there without it being having any contact with any mild steel. So if we have contact with mild steel, over time it oxidizes the oil and starts turning it into a, a useless goop that we can't use as a fuel. So it's critical that we get a paint that not only lasts, so we have to get something that's gonna stay on there. So it's gonna be diesel in these tanks as well as veggie oil. So from time to time we'll swap between the two. So we have to make sure that the paint can, can hold up to, to diesel um, and it has to be able to stay on there and stay put over the long term. We don't wanna to have to be doing Doing this in two or three years time so we did um, we had we had some pretty specific requirements the boat's going to be going into the ice which means it's going to be hitting ice the hull's going to flex we're going to be in some pretty atrocious weather at times so all of that puts a load on the hull on the, the stringers and the ribs and so on and the boat will flex and bend and carry on where the fuel tanks are in the front um, is, is pretty much where the boat takes the maximum load so we have to make sure that whatever we paint wise whatever we put in there it has to be flexible um, and it also has to be really really chemically resistant so we checked out a bunch of different brands um, we did quite a bit of research on on what we're going to use and and you know the chemical makeup and so on of the different types of paints and we settled on a brand called kbs it's a it's an australian company um, and some of their products are just absolutely bloody kick-ass so um, yeah we're using a particular product here that's specific to our application um, but I, I actually found out that they do a lot of products if you're looking at um, reconditioning a uh, like a rusted out fuel tank if you've got like a pinhole and you can't find it they have products that actually seal that and it's um it's similar to what we're going to be using here but it chemically bonds to the steel and uh, yeah you end up with a, a really durable long-term solution so we'll get into it and show you how we did it so the paint that we're using today is uh, the stuff called rust seal by kbs um, coating so they're an australian company um, and they've been awesome in terms of like technical advice and things like that So we went into real specific detail about you know exactly what we're trying to do how we're going to prepare the steel um, What we're doing with it, you know both diesel and veggie oil are going to be used in these tanks um, And and yeah, these guys were awesome um, we, we chopped and changed with a few ideas as to which product was going to be the best one for it um, You know within their range and that and um, and it came out that rust seal was the one that we're going to use um, so what we're, I'm going to walk you through the process of basically putting this paint on. It's um, it's fairly particular to get it right, um, but once it's on, it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a rock solid paint. Um, it's it's got flexibility, so as the boat sort of bashes around and jumps up and down off waves and things like that and hits ice and whatever, and the sides of the hull will flex. It's it's basically designed to have some flex in it so that it can allow for that, but at the same time not break down and, and actually cause a failure um, where the oil can touch the steel. Um, so that's yeah, that's why we chose this paint in the end. Um, uh, we, we looked at quite a few different options, and this was yeah by far and away the one that's going to have the best sort of qualities for what we're looking for. So up in the tank, we've got you can sort of see quite a few sort of like right angles, and there's ribs and things that have got little bends and, and what have you all around them. Um, when we put the paint on, it's really important that we get a full coverage over all of those. So so this paint's capable of being brushed, sprayed, or um, or rolled. We're going to be brushing and rolling this one today. Um, so we brush it out, what we call stripe out the corners. So stripe out all of the difficult bits to get. Um, if we can't get it with a roller, we'll get it with a brush. Um, and it also, this paint has a self-leveling capability. So if you put it on with a brush and then sort of let it sit, it'll it'll start to smooth itself out. So where you'd normally get like little ripples in your, in your paint from the brush strokes, you, you put it on and then give it time and it'll actually set, settle itself down and go into a nice smooth coating. Um, so that's particularly good for us because um, stopping those little ridges and bumps and things is basically gives um, you know diesel bug or anything like that less less sort of um, surface area to grab onto so um, yeah pretty important uh, quality for us so before I get started on this paint um, I actually just wanted to talk about gloves so when I paint um, I used to use like the disposable gloves you get from the supermarket or whatever and they're pretty garbage you know and as soon as you start getting into like two pack epoxies and things like that they pretty much just fall apart and melt on your hands um, but uh, Adrian at KBS sent us up um, a packet of these um, nitrile gloves and man, I've got to say, they are just unbelievably good, eh? They're, just, they're reasonably thick, they're still disposable, so they're nowhere near as thick as like a dishwashing glove. But man, they just don't break down, eh? Like, like we've, we've been using these, what do we use them so for? We've done uh, metal etch, we've done epoxy etches, we've done high build etches, uh, about to do the fuel tank paint. They're just, they're just phenomenal, eh? They just don't break down. So um, yeah, if, you, if you're going to do some painting and it's a, like it's a full-on paint, Man, grab a set of these, eh? I'll chuck a link in the description below, but yeah, grab a set of these, they're just amazing things.
So you can see this paint has multiple different colours that are just sitting in the can when you open it. Um, it's really important that you mix it up. Like all paints, it's really important that you mix it up incredibly well. So you, the heavier components will fall to the bottom over time when the paint can is just sitting on the shelf. Um, and the only way to basically make sure you're getting the best quality out of the paint is to just mix it as thoroughly as possible. So normally when you first open a can, you want to probably mix it for a good two or three minutes, three or four minutes, something like that, just to really make sure that you've mixed all of those solids around um, in the solvents. Um, because when the paint dries onto, the, onto your wood or your steel or whatever it is that you're painting, um, it's the solids that are in the paint that actually do the work of um, you know, protecting it from whatever it is, moisture or rust or whatever it may be. So if you don't mix it well enough, you'll end up with a really rubbish finish on your paint and you'll end, it'll end up just failing on you. So when we paint today, we're gonna to be using a fluffy roller. Um, the main reason is with these big flat panels, the fluffy roller allows me to get paint right up and under, um, underneath these ribs and so on. So they're not fully welded all the way down and uh, this allows me to push the paint all the way through quite easily. If it's a more difficult space, I'd be using a paintbrush to get that uh, to stripe those areas out, but I know I can do it with these fluffy rollers. There you have it, as quick as that. So it's pretty fast to, uh, to paint the stuff on. It's quite a thin paint, um, which for us is actually really good because it means you get a lot of area covered per litre. Um, geez, I probably use maybe quarter of a litre to do that, um, those two big panels. So it's a, it's a really economical paint in terms of like how far it goes. Like a lot of the epoxies that we use are really thick. Um, so for example, to paint the deck, um, we used, well geez, close to probably 15 litres of paint. Um, just to do our, the deck alone, um, because and that's simply because it's such a thick paint. So this, um, yeah, the, the thin paints are, are actually quite easy to paint on, and they also go a long way. So when you blast, you'll always end up finding things that you weren't expecting. So up here, you can see there's a little blemish. It's actually a bolt hole. So somebody, at some point, has drilled all the way through uh, into the fuel tanks and then they've just covered it up up top with a bit of paint or something like that. So um, yeah, we found half a dozen of those uh, in the front tanks. So what we're doing is we go through and when we find one, we chuck a bit of tape over it like that. It allows us to paint, there's another one over here. This allows us to basically paint the tank and then when we're finished, we rip those off and we're still left with lovely clean steel um, where, the, where the hole or the blemish is. Um, and then we can fill that up with weld and do it properly. In many ways, rusted steel is the absolute perfect medium to put paint on. So this was a fairly rusted piece of steel. Once you blast it, you can see how pitted and manky the surface is. It's actually perfect for paint to hold on to. So when you start putting the paint on, you can see the shiny sort of paint and so on over the rusted steel. There's lots of pits and bumps and scratches and so on for that paint to grab hold of. So you've got actually a higher chance of rusted steel that's been prepped properly holding on um, paint and you have new shiny steel. So we're right up in the fuel tank now and you can see this paint flows on really really easily so I'm putting it on quite thick in these corners and then I'm, so you can sort of see that I'm putting it on quite thick in these corners and then I'm rolling it out. So I really want to get under these ribs, I don't want any mild steel possibility happening in these ribs. So I push it on quite hard in there and then thin the paint right out when I roll it like so. So you can sort of see the surface profile. If I come right down onto the steel, you can see it's, it's, it was rusted and they've sandblasted it and it, it's like quite, quite a gap up now. Um, but you know, <laughs> look how easy that paint just goes over those pores. So um, yeah, the, the viscosity of paint's quite thin, which is a massive advantage for doing this because um, it really gets into all those little wee spots. Um, we did a, a tank a while back with a, a, um, a, a two-pack epoxy. It was a, it was a like, specific tank paint, two-pack epoxy, food grade stuff, and it was really quite thick. And the issue that we had with the paint when it was as thick as that was that it was really, really difficult to push it into the corners. And, it, and it, I'm pretty sure it didn't necessarily go into the corners, it just kind of formed a big, um, I don't know, like a big bead over top of the, uh, 
the quarters and stuff, so I wasn't 100% convinced that it was actually a great coat, whereas because this is like, it's, it's quite a bit thicker than water, but it has like a similar sort of feel when you roll it out, that you can really push it around and get it right up and under the corners, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased that it's actually a thinner paint than what I normally use. All right, so it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so this has been on here for, I don't know, two or three hours or so. Um, just do a quick touch dry check, see if it's, oh no, beautiful. So this is all ready to do its second coat. So you can sort of see up in here, lighting's a wee bit harsh, but basically the, um, the tank has had its um, first coat applied right the way across, right up into that front corner there. So now we're just gonna go through um, and put the second coat on. There's a couple of runs, but it really doesn't matter, it's a fuel tank. Um, and... against the center of the boat there. Um, we've put in a really thick bead of paint, so we've pushed it right through and then rolled it out and thinned it right out on either side. So the instructions on this paint say for um, two thin coats. So we've done that, but one of the ways that we made sure that we got all of the, the edges and everything coated was, was really ran the thick coat of paint um, into those gaps and then um, from there roll it out and basically make sure that we're not, you know, haven't got too, too thick a coat happening. Um, but as you can sort of see, it's come up really beautiful. Um, you can still clearly see the pit marks and everything in it from the previous rust that was sandblasted out. Um, so yeah, the paint, as you can sort of see, it's a thin paint. It doesn't, it basically doesn't go over and, and smooth everything out to be like a big uniform finish, but that actually doesn't matter. Um, and particularly with a rusted tank, it's, it's better to sort of um, allow the paint to have a thinner paint so that it really seeps into those rust pores, which is exactly what it's done. So um, yeah, we're stoked with how it's come up. Um, really chuffed and, and looking forward to actually getting a bit of oil in here and starting to test the paint a wee bit. So after all of the sandblasting, there's um, generally piles and piles of dust and sandblasting garnet and so on to deal with. So all of this brown stuff, the ready brown stuff you can see all the way along there, is all the sandblasting garnet. So Jess is just up um, cleaning the last of it off. It's, quite, it's really dusty. So we haven't been able to ventilate and open the boat up, so she's just up here um, getting the last bit off. Um, we can't do any painting until all of this is done, because obviously water running down the boat and stuff like that. So, no, no, nah, nah, today's yeah, it'll probably only take 20 minutes or something for it to be dry enough to, to start working on. Yep, yep. So it's the first time you, I suppose we've been able to have a real good look at the bow up here, so you can sort of see all the way around is um yeah lovely nice big thick coat of etch so we've so this is stainless and this is mild steel and then obviously there's a weld you know to join the two together we paint up and over the weld um, because in that weld will be molten mild steel so that will rust even though it's a stainless wire that'll rust so we bring the, the paint up and over that so we've still got another three layers of paint to put up here so this is the first etch um, so we'll do one more etch and then two top coat uh, but we're going to leave the top coat until we're just about ready to launch um, and we'll come through and give this all a sand and then we'll, we'll paint the top coat on um, mainly because the, we can't really stop the top coat from just colouring with all of our we've still got a lot of boat to build so um, you know dragging welders around and grinders and anything else um, pretty much just ruins that top coat Jess is um, up on top of the wheelhouse here with us and 
um, yeah, we're basically just going through and rolling it out. So you can see we've done the rear roof now. We're just painting ourselves off the top of the boat basically. So work from the back of the wheelhouse forward. Um, but uh, yeah, it's sort of a two-step process. So we go around like all of the, the edges, get a big thick bead of paint all the way around those. And then as you can sort of see over there, we basically paint our way back in um, using the big roller. So that's us for the day. Um, yeah, we're still living in a bit of a bomb site. We've got to go through probably tomorrow. I think what we'll do is we'll go through um, and clear up all of this stuff. You can sort of see behind me there's yeah just just random parts everywhere. So we need to go through and stack it. So under the boat it's pretty clear now. Um, so we'll go through, organise things a bit better. One of the thoughts I had was actually moving my um, metalworking bench and my woodworking bench to be under the back end of the boat so when they stuck the boat back in I actually got them to lift it up a bit to give myself some headroom underneath the boat so either side of the prop what I'm thinking is basically just come out of the light so either side of the prop I'm thinking of basically putting a bench one on the left one on the right and then I can put a tarp across the back end of the boat um, and it basically protects us from the weather but it also means we've got a lot more working space so looking forward to that it's been a wee bit of a tight squeeze um, as you saw on the radar videos there's not a huge amount of room to work where I was before so be nice to have a slightly bigger workshop. So part of emptying out these fuel tanks of sand after they've been blasted, um, I need to get, I've got these one inch um, 316 stainless bungs that are in here that I've got to remove and um, that allows me to basically drain a lot of the sand um, out of these. The trouble is this one here, when I've welded it, it's obviously gone a bit oval shaped and it's locked up. So I've tried getting it off with my big, uh, my big 36 inch wrench and it's, um, it's not moving. Well, it's, it's moving a little bit. It's only going sort of quarter a turn. So I know it's loose, but um, yeah, it's jamming up again. So my plan is to get a socket. I'm gonna hammer it on because we've got a few bits of like well slag and stuff like that around the edges. Um, I'm gonna hammer this on so it's on there nice and tight. And then I'm just gonna get my ratchet in there and just um, yeah, crank it off. And then I'll probably put it, run a tap up there and actually just clean it out so that it's a bit more, open, a bit more round. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go and get a new bung so this, this bung will die, but um, yeah, not the worry. had a bit of a snag with our fuel tank um, so the second tank that we're doing uh, we've found that there's a bit of a hole um, in the front of it so I was going to try and patch it up with a, a, an arc welder a stick welder um, but I'm not very confident with that and uh, yeah I'm blowing holes in it so I gave up pretty fast on that one and I'm uh, I'm now going to put a patch over top of it and put it in with my MIG um, I'm miles more confident that I can weld uh, with my MIG and, and have no issues in terms of leaks so that's my plan um, I'm gonna winch the MIG down. So part of the reason why I was doing it with the stig, with the stig, with the, the TIG welder, oh, fuck me, TIG, stick welder, bloody hell. Part of the reason why I was doing it with the stick welder was I was just being a lazy bugger and not getting my um, my MIG welder down after the big move. So everything's packed up inside the boat. So it's a bit of a mission getting that welder down, um, but I gotta get it down. I got heaps of other work to do down here. So I've just been putting it off. So. Uh, looks like I won't be painting the tanks today, I'll be pulling that welder down and fixing this hole that we've found. So behind this plate, we had a small pinhole that the sandblasting revealed. So um, that's pretty common when you sandblast is you start to see things that you didn't know were there previously. So what we've done, I tried to pad weld it on this side of the tank, but I'm getting basically too much blow through. Um, the, it's obviously thin for like about a 50 cent piece size through here, we think is probably a bit thin. Um, so I've cut a, a plate that's significantly bigger than what we need. Um, and we're gonna go through and basically weld that in uh, right across that whole area. So 
Um, this is six mil steel, so yeah, we'll have plenty of thickness through there. I've made the plate way too big, um, but you know, this is not gonna be an issue. Over engineering, this is certainly not gonna cause any issues for us. So uh, there we go, the patch is all welded in. So obviously this bit here hasn't been sandblasted, it's just um, flap wheeled down. Um, what I do when, I will be sandblasting this. So when I, I'm gonna paint the tank, but I'm gonna leave this area here unpainted. Um, and then when I come in and, and go through and weld up all of these edges on this big, the hole down in here, um, this here will be uh, left unpainted as well. I'll weld all of this in, and then we'll sandblast the weld and, and the areas around the paint. Um, and then repaint those. And, I, and it's at that stage there that I'll sandblast this. So there'll just be a little patch up here that won't be painted that'll get dealt with later um, once we can sandblast it inside the tank. This paint stuff that we use, KBS. So this is a paint that's specific for like fuel tanks and things like that. Mm. They make a few different variations of it. Yeah, so um, Adrian uh, at KBS, we, we sort of worked with him to take a bit of a guesstimate as to how much paint we'll, we'll use. Um, it was a bit of a guess, best guess, like it was the best guess in terms of surface area on my part and then <laughs> also how much and how thick the coats would be on Adrian's part. So I think we got pretty close. We got, we, the initial order was 10 litres and we got pretty close. Um, and uh, we're just going to get another two litre sent up, which I think will easily um, do what we need to do. Yeah. One of the things I love about building Brewpig is the generosity of others. Um, we met this guy called Callum, who uh, previously in our yard to a video, so I'll put a link up in the description up the top here. Um, he said that he bought one of the boats that was sitting out the back that I pointed to the anchor on, um, and it happens to be sitting right beside the boat now. <laughs> so that's his boat. And um, yeah, anyway, uh, he gave us a hand and I gave him a hand and it was sort of a bit of a back and forth of um, yeah, working bee on each other's boat as needed and whatever. And um, yeah, lo and behold, uh, he shot off back to work for Fortnite. And um, yeah, he ended up leaving a whole bunch of uh, welding electrodes um, on Brewpig. So i just really like to say thanks. Cheers, Callum. We'd always find somewhere to hide when we were kids so we could see and hear the water run. The river's gonna cry when you're gone.